Welcome to Open to Debate. I am your guest moderator, Gillian Tett, standing in for John Donovan, and I'm absolutely delighted to be here today. Now, I was recently in Kiev, where there is heated debate right now over not just how to win the war, although that's very important, but also how to win the peace. And central to that is a question of money. Where are the resources going to come from to rebuild Ukraine in the future? And that cuts to the key issue we're going to be discussing today, which is should Ukraine get Russia's frozen assets? There's a lot of money there. And there are very divergent views on this. So let's get in and hear about our debaters today. On the yes side of the question, should Ukraine get Russia's frozen assets, we have former Treasury Secretary Lawrence Summers, Larry Summers. Welcome back to Open to Debate, Larry. Good to be with you. And arguing no to the question of should Ukraine get Russia's frozen assets, we have the Senior Fellow and Director of International Economics at the Council on Foreign Relations, Ben Steele. Ben, great to have you here. Thanks for having me, Julian. Now, before we start, I want to get a sense of why you are here today. What motivates you to make this argument? Larry, you go ahead and tell us what is driving your passion on this issue. I think the case for taking Russia's currently frozen assets and using them to support the victims of Russia's aggression is compelling on moral grounds, compelling on economic grounds, compelling on political uh, grounds, and compelling on effectiveness uh, grounds. Reality is that you can debate the precise amount of damage that Ukraine has suffered because of Russia's aggression. You can debate the exact efficacy of assistance. You can debate the best ways to deploy funds, what the right role of the private sector is, and so forth. But the conclusion is, I think, inescapable that Russia has aggressed against Ukraine, that the cost of that aggression is immense, that the global stake in Ukraine's resisting that aggression and renewing a strong state is immense. These are resources that are available. These are resources that, if used, mean that taxpayer resources of Western countries will not have to be used. These are resources that will preserve existing foreign assistance modalities for Africa, for climate change, for global poverty. And this will send a strong signal of the legality uh, and inappropriateness of aggression of the kind Russia has uh, engaged in. So right, I think Larry, the I'm case stop you is there. clear. Right, I'm going to stop you there, Larry, because we're going to hear your argument very clearly in a few moments. I just want to know what's driving your own personal passion here. Um, ben, can you tell me quickly, what is the reason why you decided to join this call today? Well, there's no difference between Larry and me about the ethics of seizing Russian reserve assets. I mean, uh, Russian is, uh, cl Russia is clearly the aggressor um, in, in this conflict, uh, and they should be made responsible for uh, repairing the, the enormous damage to um, uh, Ukraine. The, the debate between me and Larry is going to be about the effectiveness of uh, a strategy of seizing um, Russian reserve assets. Given wider um, U.S. and Western priorities, um, I think it would be, from a, an effectiveness standpoint, a very bad decision indeed. Right. OK, so you both agree that you care deeply about the future of Ukraine, that you want to help, but do you have different perspectives on exactly how to do that in relation to the assets? In line with the format of this program, you're each going to now have four minutes to state your case and make your opening pitches. So, Larry, you're up first. You answer yes to the question, 
Should Ukraine get Russia's frozen assets? Tell us why in four minutes. We've already discussed that Ukraine needs those needs substantial resources to reconstruct its economy. We've already discussed that Russia is the clear aggressor uh, here and has forfeit moral right uh, to uh, those assets because it's obliged morally to compensate Ukraine. International law provides clearly for the principle of compensation. And this is a case where compensation is clearly necessary, clearly appropriate, and where the need for that compensation has been recognized very broadly uh, internationally. Russia has felt free to seize assets of Western uh, companies. There are many precedents um, at, during and after wars when the assets of aggressing states have been put to use to resist uh, and to compensate the victims of their aggression. Put frankly, there is no other viable way. The needs are measured well above $100 billion. Even if that money could be found for Ukraine in other ways, it would surely come at the expense of other foreign assistance efforts at a time when those efforts as well need to be substantially augmented for the benefit of uh, Africa, for the benefit of climate change, for the benefit of protecting against uh, pandemics. So this is right for taxpayers. This is right for uh, the world as a whole. And I think it's right to send a signal about the consequences for aggressing states in terms of assets that they have deployed. Some worry that this will somehow set an unfortunate financial precedent. First of all, we've already crossed that Rubicon. These assets have been frozen. No one believes that uh, they are actually going to be back for uh, Putin's use. And we have seen no appreciable consequences in uh, global foreign exchange uh, markets. Second of all, the actions here are really quite extreme and uh, extraordinary, not of a kind that take place on any kind of uh, regular uh, basis. And last, uh, this is something that is clearly justified by uh, international uh, law. And so I believe that it is very important that at a critical time when people are looking for global action, the international community move forward. Well, thank you very much indeed, Larry, for that very forceful argument. Um, so now let's hear from Ben. Ben, you obviously care deeply about the fate of Ukraine, but you argue no to the question, should Ukraine get Russia's frozen assets? Tell us why. Yeah, From an effectiveness standpoint, there are three reasons why I would oppose outright seizure of uh, Russian reserve assets. Uh, the first uh, reason would be uh, legal. Um, I disagree with Larry on the uh, legal basis for seizing the assets. The second would be geostrategic, that I think the United States and indeed the, the West as a whole have geostrategic um, uh, aims that would be undermined by an outright seizure. And the third is um, uh, history. As Mark Twain said, history may not uh, repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And I do think there are things that we can learn from the past with regard to the present conflict in Ukraine. First, from a legal perspective, um, in terms of international law, outright seizure of Russian reserve assets would be 
uh, illegal under the doctrine of sovereign immunity. There are exceptions there. The main one is for what's called um, uh, countermeasures. States are entitled to take countermeasures in order to bring an aggressor back into compliance with international law. But the important caveat there is that the any countermeasures that are taken need to be reversible. And in the case of outright seizure of Russian reserves, giving them to Ukraine, it would not be reversible. In terms of domestic U.S. law, there are complicated issues there. I've got very little time, so I'm just going to quote Janet Yellen on this, and I think she has the final word, quite frankly. Um, quote, it would not be legal in the United States for the government to seize these assets, unquote. Uh, from a practical perspective, we have to acknowledge that uh, other major states around the world think that the uh, seizure would be illegal. China, India, Brazil, 87 uh, countries abstained or voted against a UN resolution in November of 2022, which was going to set the grounds for Russian reparations. The consequences of outright seizure, I think, would be extremely severe. Other states might seize U.S. Uh, assets in the in the future on the grounds that on the pretext that the U.S. had made such uh, unilateral determinations in the past. We could see the movement of uh, foreign reserve as assets out of the U.S. dollar and out of U.S. jurisdiction. Um, we could see de-dollarization of trade. Now, Larry and I agree that there's no uh, imminent replacement currency for the U.S. dollar, but you could see the world trading system basically devolve into a form of barter in which states try to maintain uh, bilateral uh, balances uh, between them, which would really undermine the multilateral trading system. In terms of larger geostrategy, um, we're not going to end this conflict with Russia simply surrendering and pulling its troops out. At best, we're going to have an armistice. There needs to be some measure of Russian tacit cooperation in order to reconstruct um, uh, Ukraine. To get that, we're going to need regime change um, uh, in uh, Moscow. And in order to promote regime change, we need to, ha uh, to offer the Russians some prospect of unfreezing the assets in the future. Um, with a peace deal in, in, in which Russia would be uh, obligated to pay some form of reparations. In terms of history, many have referred to the Marshall Plan as a model for reconstructing Ukraine. Uh, three years before the Marshall Plan in 1947, we had the Morgenthau Plan in 1944, which was very punitive, which would have dismembered Germany, deindustrialized it. Um, and this very punitive strategy, which also involved massive reparations, um, uh, actually prolonged the war. It gave Hitler propaganda to keep the troops um, fighting and made it more difficult for the United States to pro promote positive regime change in uh, Germany and therefore was abandoned. There's also the case of Czechoslovakia, which bordered the Soviet Union. They were invited to participate in the Marshall Plan. Um, they wanted to participate in the Marshall Plan, but Stalin, in order to prevent it, precipitated a communist coup in Czechoslovakia in February of 1948 to keep them out. Uh, Ukraine suffers from the same geographic problems that uh, Czechoslovakia does. Uh, Ukraine and Russia share 1,400 miles of uh, uh, a border. So any sort of Marshall Plan in Ukraine will be impossible without that tacit cooperation from Russia that I mentioned, and we need to maintain the reserves as a bargaining chip. Right. Well, thank you very much indeed. I don't have an official buzzer, but you've both done a pretty good job of sticking to the time. So thank you. We both know where you stand. So in the next segment, we will dive in, into our discussion on our key question, should Ukraine get Russia's frozen assets after this? Hi, and welcome back to Open to Debate. I'm Gillian Tett, your guest moderator for our debate on the question, should Ukraine get Russia's frozen assets? And I'm here with Larry Summers and Ben Steele, who both just gave their opening statements or answers to that question. Larry says yes. Ben says no. Larry says yes, because essentially there is a moral, economic and political grounds in doing that, he says. He points out that in the past, there are plenty of historical precedents. He also argues that at a time when taxpayers in the West don't have a lot of spare money to give Ukraine and the re reconstruction needs are going to be absolutely enormous. We can argue about how many hundred billions or even trillions it might be, but they're certainly going to be enormous 
He argues that there's no other way to fund those reconstruction needs than to start by looking wherever you can for help, and that includes using those Russian assets that have been frozen. Ben Steele argues, in contrast, that we need to keep those assets as essentially as a bargaining chip to try and persuade, tempt or force the Russians into some form of cooperation in the future for Ukraine's hopefully post-conflict future. He also argues that, in fact, historically there haven't been many positive cases where countries have actually seized assets. On the contrary, doing that has often harmed countries to such a point that you store up more problems for the future than you actually solve. And he also points out that it may simply be illegal under American law, as Janet Yellen has suggested. And of course, many other countries around the world appear to be strongly opposed to this. So, two very different perspectives. Perhaps I can start with you, Larry, and say, what do you say to Ben's argument that actually leaving the assets frozen as they currently are could be a very useful bargaining chip for the future when dealing with Russia that the West simply does not want to throw away right now. Deploying the assets to address the needs of Ukraine would surely not dissipate all of the assets quickly. No one would contemplate that all of the assets would be spent this year or next year or the year after that. So substantial assets would remain to work through any hypothetical scenario in which there was regime change in uh, Russia and Russia was uh, requiring of or it was appropriate that there be a support. To compare What I am suggesting with the Morgenthau plan, which involved the execution of hundreds of thousands of Germans, involved the occupation of German uh, territory and the raising and destruction of German uh, capacity. To compare that with taking assets that have already been frozen and are not currently available for any Russian use and deploying them to deal with Ukraine is, I think, a very, very different uh, thing. I'm an economist, Ben uh, and I are folk, are experts on economics, I will leave the geopolitics of armistices uh, to uh, others, but it defies a belief that after what has happened, using Russia's assets, which Russia has not had access to, which Russia has not been able to use, for some substantial period of time to compensate for a portion of the damage that Russia has done to Ukraine with its aggression, that that is the equivalent of the Morgenthau plan or that that is the equivalent of the Versailles Treaty's uh, inflection on uh, Germany, I find... uh, highly implausible. And in the event that it were to happen, there is nothing to stop the um, allies at such a moment from providing whatever types of assistance were considered to be important to a nascent uh, Russian state. And if they were provided in that way, there would be the prospects of the kind of substantial conditionality and basing that support on their continuing uh, maintenance of uh, of their commitments. That's something very different than simply allowing the assets to go back automatically to Putin if he does sign an armistice or whatever succeeds him if that's what takes place. Right. Well, 
Ben, you are a historian. I don't think anyone's going to out-history you on these details. Um, but what I'd like to know is, you know, Larry says basically it's ridiculous to make that comparison because um, what happened after World War II was of an order of magnitude bigger. Would you agree, and can you remind us just how big the frozen assets are um, at the moment? I mean, what kind of numbers are we talking about? And really, does it shrivel in comparison to World War II or not? Yeah, um, as I said at the outset, to quote Mark Twain, his history uh, doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And there are elements of um, uh, the reparations regime after World War II that we can compare to what we're talking about now. Um, the Russians, for example, after World War II were demanding 10 billion in reparations, which um, in current dollars would be one third, one third of the size of the Russian uh, central bank reserves that we're talking about seizing now. So this is, this is very substantial money that we're talking about here. Now, what would be- 300 billion from memory. Just over, th this. over 300 um, uh, billion um, US dollars, so extremely su substantial. Also quite difficult um, uh, to, to seize legally, where the, the, this is spread among uh, many jurisdictions is going to require an unprecedented level of um, cooperation. So there, there aren't uh, any good historical examples of a, a seizure uh, on this scale. But more importantly, let's just assume uh, for the sake of argument that, that uh, the, um, when the, the, the fighting pauses, uh, uh, Putin is still in power. It is a physical impossibility to start a major reconstruction uh, effort, again, without some form of tacit cooperation from Russia. I'm not talking about a peace treaty, just a willingness to let it go forward. They can immediately destroy any infrastructure that we um, uh, start to build. Um, they can undermine the uh, ability of the Ukrainian state to, to function through uh, cyber attacks. Um, uh, of course, um, the seizure of uh, assets of, of any state that will participate uh, in the seizure of its uh, own assets. So to even talk about the possibility of a massive reconstruction effort without at least Russia agreeing to sit on the sidelines and not interfere strikes me as being wholly unrealistic. We need to have those reserves in order to prepare for the day when there's a new Russian regime that will be willing to, to come to the table and talk about a comprehensive settlement, not just with Ukraine, but with the West. We need that not just for peace and security in Ukraine, but for Eastern Europe more widely. But what about the other assets that have also been seized from Russian oligarchs, Ben? Yeah. Would you treat those differently or put them in the same camp? Because they're not as big as the central bank assets, but they're still pretty sizable. Uh, they're not there. We're talking about tens of billions there. Um, in, in that regard, there are significant legal issues as well, not just in the United States and uh, uh, in, in Europe, uh, relating to the necessity of proving um, uh, that, that criminal activity um, was involved, associating the um, uh, activities of these oligarchs with um, uh, the activities of the Russian state in U Ukraine. Um, so uh, clearly the ethical case is, is, is there, um, but the legal case is uh, difficult to make. And I'm just trying to emphasize that there are uh, much wider geostrategic issues um, uh, involved um, uh, in the U Ukraine crisis than just um, uh, how much is going to be spent for Ukrainian reconstruction and exactly where the dollars will come from in the uh, short term. Larry, what do you say about the point about the illegality of it? Because, you know, when I was in Kiev recently, um, and it's impossible to go to Ukraine without feeling this overwhelming sense of the need to help somehow. What's happened is so appalling, unjust, brutal. Who would have guessed we'd be facing genocide in you know, or attempted genocide in Europe um, in the 21st century. So my question to you, though, is this, you know, when you look at what's happening, what people in Ukraine pointed out is it's not really just an American decision. If there was going to be the assets being seized, it would affect European law as well. We've heard Janet Yellen saying that she doesn't think it's legal under, Euro under US law, 
how can you possibly have this go through um, when it seems to be so unclear under European law? I'm not a lawyer. I don't think Ben's a lawyer. I don't think you're a lawyer. I don't think Janet Yellen is a lawyer. Larry Tribe is perhaps the leading uh, constitutional lawyer in the United States, and he has just come out with a 150-page brief explaining in detail why this is legal under IEPA in uh, the United States, under um, the principle of compensation that Ben referred to under international law. The government of Canada has concluded that this is legal under international law. A range of other international attorneys have suggested that this is legal under international law. I suspect that as legal research within the U.S. government continues and is um, influenced by the thinking of my colleagues uh, who've worked with me on this effort and taught me a great deal, uh, former U.S. Deputy Secretary of State and World Bank President and law school graduate Robert Zellick, hardly a radical and unorthodox uh, figure. And Philip uh, Zellico, uh, now at the Hoover Institution, formerly of the Bush One National Security uh, staff, also an attorney and not a radical, unorthodox figure. I suspect you may see some evolution in the thinking of the U.S. government on uh, these uh, legal uh, questions. Look, we all are citizens of the world, uh, Jillian. These matters are not clear-cut as a matter of legalisms, and successful leaders of countries look to their lawyers to provide legal authority for things that are imperative to do. And I can assure you that the legal case here is far stronger than the legal case in any number of actions in the student loan sphere, in the immigration sphere, in the environmental sphere, that governments of both parties in uh, the United States have uh, undertaken. And I'm not an expert on European law, but my understanding is that the European Union respects the principle of uh, compensation as part of these determinations. It's just wrong to say that there's a sovereign immunity issue uh, here. Sovereign immunity refers to judicial actions taken in one country's courts with respect to another uh, country. This is not an action being taken in any court. This is an action being taken by executive authorities according to uh, the compensation uh, principle. Right. Well, reading between the lines, what you appear to be saying unusually tactfully is you think that Janet Yellen is wrong um, or not yet completely appraised of all the arguments as of yet. Um, doesn't appear to be the first time one might have said that. Um, but um, it's obviously going to be debated a lot by lawyers going forward. And since we are none of us lawyers, maybe we should, in fact, turn to a more practical economic issue, which is that Ben has pointed out that if the assets were frozen, other countries might well lose faith in the U.S. dollar system going forward. Um, seized. I think you mean seized, seized Jimmy. Sorry, yeah. Not frozen, seized. Thank you. Um, ben, how serious is the threat of a run away from the dollar as a result of the seizure of these assets? Well, and then, Harry, I'd like to ask the same question to you in a moment. We've already um, seen many countries raise um, concerns about um, uh, what they call weaponization of the U.S. dollar. It's not just China. It's not just India. It's not just Brazil. It's um, it's uh, South Africa. It's uh, Saudi Arabia. It's Kenya. I could go on and on and on. 
Now, again, um, I would stress that Larry and I agree that there is no um, immediate successor uh, waiting in the wings to the US dollar to play the dollar's role. Having said that, that does not mean that you could not still see a de-dollarization of the um, uh, global trading system. What you're already in effect seeing um, is countries engaging in forms of barter trade, swapping commodities for commodities, uh, Iran and Iraq, for example, oil for uh, gas. Um, you're seeing limited use of other national currencies in international trade, but not in the same way as the US dollar is used, um, where exporters are happy to um, uh, maintain excess dollars as a store of value. But what they're actually seeking to do um, uh, is to balance their trade bilaterally with each of their national trading partners. And if the whole world were to move materially in that direction, you would have a fundamental destruction of the multilateral trading system that we've come to depend on over the past several decades. That would mean a much less efficient uh, global uh, economy. So I really do think we should be very concerned about the wider economic um, uh, effects of an outright seizure, as opposed to merely an indefinite freezing of the assets until we have a peace treaty that involves some form of reparations. Larry, are you worried about de-dollarization as a result of this kind of, not just having seized the asset, frozen the assets, but actually seizing them? First of all, I think the distinction between freezing for an indefinite horizon and seizing is a very small one. And so whatever risks there are in this, we have already crossed that Rubicon. Second, this is something that's very different than most of the issues where people talk about weaponization of the dollar, because this is the simultaneous weaponization, if you want to see it that way, of the euro, the Canadian dollar, the British pound, and uh, the Japanese uh, yen. So I'm not sure where uh, somebody else is uh, going uh, to go to uh, deploy their assets. Third, if Iran and Iraq, if Iran is forced into a certain measure of more barter trade with Iraq, I, for one, think that's probably a good thing rather than a bad thing, uh, starting from uh, where we are uh, now. And I find the idea that this is going to cause the generalized breakdown of the world trading system uh, to be, respectfully, Ben, um, something that's quite hyperbolic. There's a real question here. There is a real question here. And the fundamental question is, are we going to give the aggressor, Putin, veto power over the establishment of subsequent uh, arrangements and take the position that we somehow have to bribe him to stop his wanton aggression? And... That is not a position that I think most uh, in the West uh, want to take after what has happened. And it's a position that is inconsistent with other things. The G7 collectively declared that Putin was a war criminal. Once we are at a place where we have collectively declared that Putin is a war criminal. I don't understand the uh, position uh, being taken here that we can't be in a position of using Russia's resources to compensate for the damage that has been done. Jillian, you were in Ukraine. I, was, I have not been uh, in uh, Ukraine. But my understanding is that even as the conflict continues, there are pressing needs for support for certain kinds of reconstruction right now. So I'm astonished by Ben's idea that until we have 
gotten Putin to acquiesce, we can't be in a position prudently of beginning a process of reconstructing Ukraine so as to enable it to uh, maintain its strength. Well, listen, I'm, I'm sure Ben would point out that, in fact, he was talking about not just Putin, but future Russian regimes, hopefully post-Putin regimes, um, and trying to find ways to tempt them to be cooperative and things. But um, we're almost out of time in this section. Um, I'd just like to quickly float to both of you a question which I heard voiced in Kiev, which was, even if you don't directly seize the assets, could you securitize them or use part of them to essentially provide the underpinning of an insurance program to tempt Western companies to go into Ukraine and be compensated out of that pot if something went wrong? Is there ways to use clever financial engineering to make the whole process a bit more palatable or a bit more um, harder to understand for the wider geopolitical community? Ben? Yeah, um, there are. Um, it's already being discussed in Europe um, as an alternative to outright seizure of the um, reserve assets, merely seizing the income of those um, uh, assets at um, uh, Euroclear in, in um, uh, Belgium. That strikes me as trying to maintain a position of being sort of half pregnant, not you know seizing a little bit, but not not too much, you know, just seizing the fruits of those assets rather than the assets them, themselves. And it, it's possible to, to um, keep the situation at a low boil doing um, something like that. Um, but to, to, to answer Larry directly, of course Putin has a veto here. And if we go into Ukraine and start doing a massive reconstruction that um, Putin can um, destroy with um, uh, a handful of cruise missiles, he has uh, veto power. Um, and we accepted uh, after World War II that um, uh, Stalin had veto power over what we did in Czechoslovakia. Why? We had no, no troops in Czechoslovakia at the end of the war, uh, whereas Stalin had hundreds of thousands of Soviet troops right on the border. Um, so we made a concession to reality after World War II um, uh, that certain countries um, uh, to the east of uh, um, the end of the uh, Iron Curtain um, were going to be in the Soviet sphere because we were not willing to go to um, a nuclear war against the Soviets to bring those states into the, the Western fold. Uh, likewise, we're not going to do that in Ukraine. So this is not about getting Putin to acquiesce. Again, this is about getting some form of what I would emphasize would be tacit cooperation um, from um, the Russians. And I don't believe we're going to get that without a, a new regime um, uh, in Russia. And so there has to be, at the end of the day, to even begin a massive reconstruction, um, uh, an, ag an agreement um, with Russia exact uh, as to exactly the contours of their um, uh, ultimate um, uh, financial responsibility here. And there would be extreme consequences to Russia financially for not coming to, um, uh, to a final deal. The sanctions would stay in place. Um, the asset freeze um, uh, will re remain in place. This will, in my view, put enormous political pressure on the Putin regime over time and hopefully will eventually undermine it. Right. Well, I my can see from Larry's face, my... he strongly disagrees. Larry, you've got 30 seconds before we go to the next section, and you'll get more chance to rebut Ben later on. My friend Ben has a very different concept of this war than I think the G7 does. The G7 is not fighting this war so that Ukraine can have the status of a nation on the wrong side of the Iron Curtain when it ends after all the sacrifices that it has made. So I find absurd the suggestion. I assume that at some point uh, Ukraine is going to join the European Union in a way that would not have been possible for the enslaved states after the end of the Second World War. So the idea that this whole line of argument is premised on a view that Ukraine is analogous to post-World War II Czechoslovakia seems to me to be misunderstand the posture that President Biden and every other major European leader has taken throughout. 
Right. Well, we're going to have to cut it off there. I can see from both of your body languages, for those of you who are listening, not watching, that this is getting heated. So it's a great moment to bring in some outside voices and some of the guests who've been listening carefully and want to put some questions on the bigger question, should Ukraine get Russia's frozen assets after this? Hi, and welcome back to Open to Debate. I'm Gillian Tett, your guest moderator, here with Larry Summers and Ben Steele discussing the question, should Ukraine get Russia's frozen assets? Now, we've had a very lively debate already, but we're going to bring in some other voices, members of the audience, to ask some questions. I think one of the first people we have who wants to ask a question is Kate Marina, a business editor with Axios. Kate, um, welcome there. I think you're there. What is your question? Hi, yes. Thanks, Jillian, and thanks, uh, Larry and Ben. Uh, My question is actually for you, Ben. Um, You mentioned that as part of a peace plan in which the frozen assets would potentially be returned to Russia, um, that in that scenario, Russia would be asked to pay reparations. Um, And so my question is, if Russia doesn't agree to pay reparations at that point in the future, um, and considering that reparations for damages from wrongful acts are a globally recognized principle, would you at that point advocate for de- for deploying the frozen funds for the benefit of Ukraine's recovery? You know, meaning kind of as a stand in for reparations that Russia refuses to pay um, and maybe through a process of an international claims commission or, you know, something like that. But in general, what what would you be thinking then? Well, we we could start with the EU proposal to seize the income um, from the uh, Russian um, uh, frozen reserves at um, uh, Euroclear. And um, that that would provide Ukraine with approximately $3 billion a a year uh, ongoing, which it could use for reconstruction. But let's still be clear about this. I have to keep emphasizing it. Russia would af- would have to still agree not to interfere with the reconstruction process in Ukraine because they could absolutely destroy it very quickly. So the, there is there is no alternative to um, having some form of ongoing dialogue with Russia um, throughout the um, reconstruction process. Since money is fungible, at the end of the day, the money that Ukraine, uh, that Russia would pay towards reparations does not technically have to come from the reserve pool. It could come from another pool, which would provide us with some degree of, I think, legal cover for what we're doing, which is an, an, an important um, uh, internationally. But I think this is going to be a major diplomatic challenge um, uh, getting uh, such an agreement with Russia. I would imagine that to the extent that we're ultimately successful in getting um, significant reparations from Russia in, ter- in return for a comprehensive peace deal, we would not even be calling it reparations for the purpose of um, uh, uh, an official document. It will be called something else that can be sold within um, uh, Russia as not being um, uh, punitive. This is just part of normal international diplomacy. And it's not a matter of coddling Putin. It's not a matter of uh, having to ask Putin for permission. It's a matter of the realities of geography, which haven't changed since after World War II. And to go back to, to Larry's point earlier, in the case of Czechoslovakia and Poland, Um, The U.S. and the U.K., particularly the U.K., were quite adamant that they should be part of the the Western fold. As you know, Churchill felt particularly strongly about um, uh, Poland um, uh, in that regard. But we simply did not have the military resources to do it without escalating the conflict to a, to a level that was considered to be unacceptable at the time. We're in the same place right now with Ukraine with regard to the debate of not whether Ukraine will join the EU, but whether Ukraine will join NATO. And that sort of question, whether we like it or not, is going to get wrapped up into the whole issue of a comprehensive reparations uh, uh, agreement with Russia. Right. Well, I can see that Larry has got lots of thoughts swirling around his head and you'll have time in a moment, Larry, to come back in. But I want to bring in the next um, question, which is from Daniel Flatley, who is a national security reporter 
with Bloomberg's Business Week. Daniel, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon. Good to be with you. Um, my question is about congressional action on this issue. So as I'm sure you're probably aware, there's a bill called the Rebuilding Economic Prosperity and Opportunity Act or Repo Act. Um, so would that clear up any of the legal questions around the authorization for this action? Uh, would it, because it's not actually taking the action, but authorizing it, send any kind of signal to the Russians uh, that this is a serious prospect in the West, the seizing of these assets. And the third aspect of this is as we debate support for the Ukrainian war effort in the US, would this at all help shore up support for those who may have doubts about the US's continued ability to pay or uh, willingness to pay? Larry, um, do you want to pick that up at all? I know you're not trained as a lawyer, but you have been talking a lot to Larry Tribe, I, who is an I esteemed would, lawyer. I would support the legislation, though I don't think that the legislation is necessary. Um, I think adequate legal authority exists without the legislation. And I think the questions about the seriousness of U.S. will, frankly, have less to do with issues that would be cleared up by uh, legislation than they do by voices in the debate who take the positions that Ben is taking that uh, place so much emphasis on the need for Russian uh, consent and the need uh, for getting uh, Russia's permission before uh, taking uh, certain actions. And I think it's that kind of uh, concern that is most problematic in terms of buttressing morale in Ukraine. And I think it's that kind of concern that is most problematic in terms of our allies in uh, Europe as well. Yeah, just briefly, uh, that particular um, piece of legislation, uh, as was emphasized, would only authorize uh, the administration to move forward uh, on this front. But I count at least three public statements, very clear public statements from Treasury Secretary um, uh, Yellen, that outright seizure of these assets would not be legal. I really don't understand from a wholly political perspective, how at this point we could even proceed on that front, at least without um, a, a new Treasury Secretary. That seems to me to be politically implausible. Well, as we know, when you have two lawyers, you often have three opinions over time. And um, there's certainly a lot to fight for here. It's going to be fascinating as a case study for future um, law students, if nothing else. Um, Steve Leesman, um, I'd like to bring in you. Um, you're the senior economics reporter at CNBC, um, and you have a question too. What would you like to ask, Steve? Yeah, sorry for the video quality. I'm here at the airport, Julian, if you don't mind, but I, I really want to thank you and uh, Larry and Ben for putting this together. This is terrific. Um, does a simple deal get around some of these things, and simple, I say advisedly, in the sense of Russia agreeing to cede these assets um, in return for access again to the um, uh, dollar funding markets as well as the energy markets and other and removal of sanctions. The other uh, question I have is whether or not we ought to be thinking more long term about this and create some rules of the road. I don't know if that would strengthen or weaken the dollar as a global currency to have more explicit rules of what when you might or might not lose these assets in some form of uh, sanction process. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Great questions. Um, We've got a, about four minutes in total. So, Ben, you've got a couple of minutes to answer that, and then Larry. Okay. From from a, a, a practical perspective, I just want to emphasize the seriousness about the direction in which we've been heading um, since the conflict, seriousness of these financial issues. I had written a piece in um, uh, Foreign Affairs back in um, uh, 2022 um, uh, documenting the evidence that um, uh, Russia was hiding at the very least, at least many tens of billions of uh, dollars of um, U.S. securities at um, Euroclear that was uh, effectively untraceable to them because they appeared to be using Chinese intermediaries. Um, so we already know this sort of 
way of getting around um, uh, seizures works. It would be effectively um, uh, untraceable from, from my knowledge um, legally um, uh, to Russia and therefore impossible to, to seize. If we actually go forward with a, a mass seizure like this, um, you are really going to see a breakdown of the, the whole uh, legal regime surrounding custodianship of um, reserve assets uh, uh, around the world. And I think the economic uh, implications, not to mention the political implications, would be e enormous. Um, we're undermining our future um, uh, effectiveness in terms of financial statecraft. In other words, we have been able um, to date to impose financial sanctions on, on countries around the world like Iran and North Korea because of um, uh, the dominance of the dollar in uh, um, financial transactions and the ability to trace dollar assets to the ultimate owners. I'm very concerned about taking steps that would lead that system to break down entirely. Right. Um, Larry, any comments? This isn't your final statement. You will get two minutes in a moment to tell us exactly why you think Ben is totally wrong. But in answer to the question of should there be some other way of having a bargain with Russia, giving it access to dollar um, asset, uh, sorry, access to the dollar system in exchange for maybe handing over the assets. Do you see any other way to have a bargain? I don't. I don't see any great appeal in reducing our sanctions regime and starting to give them access to the dollar window that they don't have. Ben can't have it both ways. If it's possible to hold dollar assets in secret so they won't be subject to sanctions in the future, then I presume this won't do any damage to the centrality of the dollar in the system and will be a one-off uh, penalty for Putin for having made the mistake of not having used those ways uh, in uh, the past. So you can't have it both ways that it'll destroy the role of the dollar and uh, that uh, people will hide their dollar assets in the future. Well, I can see you both looking suitably indignant. And we are now coming up to the crunch point where you both get a chance to explain in two minutes what your closing arguments are. I am keenly aware that no doubt you'll both be writing more about this in the coming weeks or months. Um, I believe the Larry Tri piece is coming out soon. Ben has already written some fabulous pieces on where the Russian money appears to be going or not going. And I'm sure Larry has plenty more columns in him on this very topic. But right now, I'm going to ask you to each say in two minutes and just two minutes what your closing arguments are. I'm going to start with Larry. You've got the floor. And you're going to tell us why you answer yes to the question, should Ukraine get Russians, Russia's frozen assets? And the clock starts now. We agree that Ukraine is entitled to support. We agree that Russia has done wrong. We agree that it is feasible to make available the assets uh, to Ukraine. We agree even that it's fine to make use of the fruits of uh, the assets. So all we are discussing is whether the fruits can be transferred or whether the assets themselves can be transferred. The enormous benefit in terms of generating far more for Ukraine than would otherwise be the case, of protecting foreign assistance efforts for poverty, climate, and so forth, and for deterring the kind of stunning wrong that has been done in Russia by setting this precedent in a clear way seem to me to make an overwhelming case. And I would submit that if it was clear that those assets were in play, dwindling, and being redeployed to counter Russia's aggression, we would have more flexibility 
more leverage in any of the vitally important diplomacy that's going to be necessary before this conflict ends, which it eventually will. Well, thank you very much indeed. I think that's the first time in history I've managed to keep Professor Summers to less than two minutes, and that was a very punchy set of arguments. Ben, um, give us your two minutes worth, the clock is restarting now, of why you think it is wrong to seize Russia's assets. So I have a set of narrow concerns related um, specifically to the uh, war in Ukraine, and then I have a set of broad con uh, concerns related to the functioning of the um, uh, international financial system um, and um, the functioning of um, uh, U.S. Um, uh, geostrategic influence around the world. With regard to the narrow issue of the war in Ukraine, um, geography is an immutable fact. Um, it is a reason um, why it is far more difficult for us to provide security for some countries um, uh, in Europe, like Ukraine, rather than others that um, are situated further west. And it explains um, uh, why the border between um, NATO and the Warsaw Pact was where it was after World War II, and we can't change that. Um, uh, I continue to maintain that any sort of lasting peace, not just in Ukraine, but in Eastern Europe more widely, will require some measure of tacit cooperation with Russia. In order to get that tacit cooperation, I believe we will need regime change um, in Russia, and that asset seizure virtually guarantees a continuation of this conflict, not just between Ukraine and Russia, but between Russia and the West, even under new Russian leadership. With regard to my broad concerns, I would emphasize that governments representing um, a strong majority of the world's population disagree strongly with uh, Larry Summers. They believe that seizure would be um, uh, illegal, and my view um, uh, is that if we were to go in that direction, we would undermine the rule of law internationally, we would undermine US influence in the world, we would undermine the status of the dollar, and with that, um, uh, the continuation of the multilateral trading system we have all come to take for granted um, in spreading prosperity and reducing um, uh, poverty around the world in recent decades. Well, thank you very much indeed to both of you. You have both laid out strong arguments explaining why you deeply disagree with each other about the merits of seizing the assets. I think the one thing we can agree on, though, is a shared sense of horror about what is happening. As I said, I was recently in Kiev chatting to a friend of mine, Yulia, who comes from Kharkiv, has a young son who's serving, and out of his t group of 12 of closest friends, she told me, there are only four left alive. That is what is unfolding. That is a horror which we are all agreed in wanting to end. Where we disagree is on the tactics. So I'd just like to say a very big thank you to both of you for laying out these incredibly important arguments that are going to get only more, not less important, in the weeks ahead. I'd also like to thank our audience, Kate, Daniel and Steve, for your very thoughtful questions. This debate came out of a conversation at a recent meeting of the Aspen Strategy Group and I'd also like to thank the audience for tuning in to this episode of Open to Debate. As a non-profit, our work to combat extreme polarization that is plaguing so much of the world today through civil and respectful debate is generously funded by listeners just like you, along with the Rosencrantz Foundation and the other supporters of Open to Debate, and is also made possible by a generous grant from the Laura and Gary Lauder Venture Philanthropy Fund. Robert Rosencrantz is our chairman, Claire Connor is CEO, Leah Matho is our chief content officer, Alexis Pancrazy, Katz Kristin Muller and Marlette Sandoval are editorial producers, and Gabriel Maya is our editorial and research manager. Andrew Lipson is head of production, Max Fulton, production coordinator, Damon Whittemore, the engineer, Gabrielle Yanuccelli is our social media and digital tool platforms coordinator, Raven Baker is Events and Operations Manager, Rachel Kemp is Chief of Staff, and the theme music is by Alex Clement. It takes a village to get this done. <laughs>
And last but not least, I'm your guest moderator, Gillian Tech. Thanks for listening and see you next time.